Greetings, uh, this is Dr. Carl Gonlick uh, speaking to you from the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio, the United States. Uh, for me, it's morning time, 9 a.m., so good morning from the United States. Um, this is our second Web Orbis webinar uh, concerning optic neuropathies. Uh, last month, we talked about inflammatory and infectious optic neuropathies, and that webinar was recorded and should be on CyberSight uh, for you to review if you wish. Uh, thanks to many of you who submitted questions in advance of this webinar. I have uh, looked at the questions and have pulled out the ones that are relevant to the topics that we're going to cover today. There were some uh, questions relevant to the uh, webinar last month, so I would uh, ask you to look at that webinar, and certainly we could try to answer the questions if you still have them, but some of the questions were explained last month. Um, additionally, there were some questions regarding specific patients. Uh, the best way to probably deal with those questions is for you to use the CyberSight consultation feature. So uh, anybody can go to CyberSight and post case uh, cases uh, and have them directed to the relevant subspecialist to try to help uh, get help with those cases. So um, I would I would advise for specific patients those sorts of questions. You will be able to ask questions, type in questions during the course of this webinar, and we will try to handle all of those questions at the end of the webinar. So today we're going to talk about part two of optic neuropathy, more types of optic nerve problems, ischemic, compressive, and hereditary, and I might throw in a couple of toxic and nutritional to boot. So my objectives for this webinar to uh, that when we're done, you'll be able to differentiate different forms of ischemic optic neuropathy. You'll be able to identify presenting signs and symptoms of compressive optic neuropathy. And you'll be able to describe at least two forms of hereditary optic neuropathy. So the differential diagnosis is complicated and I'm not, I don't want you to read everything on this slide, but last time, as I mentioned, we talked about inflammation, infection, and so this time we're gonna concentrate on uh, the ischemic, hereditary, compressive, and talk a little bit about some miscellaneous causes. I'm gonna start with this case. A 68-year-old gentleman complained of blurred vision in the right eye for the past week. It was fairly sudden and painless in onset. His vision is 2060 or 618 in the right eye, normal in the left, and he has a right relative afferent pupillary defect. And so uh, my question um, for you, given that scenario, given the appearance of those optic nerves, I'm gonna maybe I'll scoot back to that for just one second, is to ask you what you think is going on um, by answering this question. I believe um, the host uh, at Orbis will um, allow this question to be asked, although I'm not entirely sure how that's gonna work. Um, and the question is, is the, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it, do you think this is ischemic, compressive, nutritional, hereditary, or inflammatory? Um, so my understanding is we're trying something a little bit different. I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not the one running the show with this question. Uh, that said, I don't see the question popping up anywhere or answers. So uh, I'll let the host, um, let's see, I'll let the host, um, uh, run the show. Here we go. Um, there's the quick poll. So basically, um, the, uh, you click on the, um, uh, I believe you just click in the box um, that you think is the correct answer, I hope. So if you think it's ischemic, click in that box. Whoops, click in that box, sorry. Click in the box outside there. And I'll let the, um, the host, the uh, Orbis host, decide when we stop. I think we have in the order of 100 people here that could potentially answer, but I think uh, we can probably close the polling now and see if the results can be broadcast. Okay, so very good, thank you. So the most likely diagnosis for most of you is the correct diagnosis, ischemic. Um, a few people thought maybe compressive, maybe nutritional, maybe inflammatory, but the vast majority said this is most likely ischemic. And that is true, certainly in an, a, an older person, and I, I joke that Every year, old, the definition of old changes. Uh, last year, old was greater than 55. This year, it's greater than 56, because that's how old I am. Um, next year, it'll be greater than 57. But someone over 50, let's say, uh, with sudden onset of, the, of uh, change in vision in one eye, who has optic disc swelling, usually are going to have an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And the A just means anterior, there has to be disc swelling. So you can't make this diagnosis in a patient who has no disc swelling. One of my residents just the other day said, 
I'm seeing this patient, they've lost vision in one eye, uh, there's no swelling of the nerve. Maybe this is a, an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. They said, by definition, it can't be an AION. But we think that these are blood supply problems. There may be diffuse, even hyperemic swelling of the disc, like you see in the photo in the bottom left. Or there may be sectoral disc swelling. It may be pallid or pale, as you see in the superior portion of the optic disc on the right. And usually, the main question is, is this non-arteritic, which is by far the most common scenario, non-arteritic AION or NAION, the risk factors being same risk factors for heart attack and stroke, in, in a sense, age, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia. Um, does the person have the disc at risk? So in the bottom left pair of optic discs, you see our patient that I just presented in the bottom in that left optic disc, meaning the patient's left optic disc. Uh, there is no swelling, but there's no cup. This is a, a disc at risk, a small congested looking optic nerve. It's normal, but it's small. Um, in con contrary to that are the two discs on the bottom right. One of the discs, the uh, left optic disc of the patient, has mild swelling. They have some cotton wool spots or nerve fiber layer infarcts in the retina. On the, in the left, their left disc, their right disc, is normal with a big cup. This is a big physiologic cup. This is not the disc at risk. So if you're thinking non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and you look at the discs and there are big cups, think again. It's not N-A-I-O-N. Recent, fairly recently, sleep apnea has been a risk factor identified in NAION. Um, I usually ask people about snoring. If they don't snore, they don't have sleep apnea. If they do snore, they may have sleep apnea. And depending on the patient and their significant other, if they're there, sometimes we will order sleep studies. Nocturnal hypotension is suggested to perhaps be the trigger of NAION, and that is that we know that when people are sleeping in the early morning waking hours, if you sleep normally, uh, everybody has their lowest blood pressure of the day. And it's thought that maybe this lower blood pressure is the trigger for NAION, which is thought to possibly be a compartment syndrome. So uh, not just hardening of the arteries, but there's something about this tight space in this disc at risk. Um, and that low blood pressure in the early morning waking hours is the actual straw that breaks the camel's back, the trigger. And so if people are taking blood pressure medications, I ask them not to take them at night because that can accentuate the low blood pressure in the early morning sleeping hours. We don't think this is related to carotid artery stenosis. This is not a big blood vessel disease. There have been studies that look at age and disease match controls. There's no increase in the degree of carotid artery stenosis. I do not order carotid Doppler studies in this condition. We know from a study done some years ago called the Ischemic Optic Neuropathy Decompression Trial, a study that came about because there were some anecdotal reports that maybe optic nerve sheath fenestration is a treatment for this condition. So a study was done across the United States where 200 patients were enrolled, 100 randomly got the surgery, 100 randomly got the gold standard, nothing. The 100 people that got nothing did better than the 100 that got the surgery, so we don't do surgery. From that study, we then followed the 100 patients who got nothing and found that over the following six months, about half had no change in their vision forever. About 43% had some improvement. Now, some improvement does not mean back to normal. It means three lines or more. So someone who's count fingers improving three lines, that's, they may think that's no improvement whatsoever. So I'm careful to say that although 43% has some improvement, that does not mean back to normal by any means. And 7% worsened, so the so-called progressive NAION. Uh, these 7% usually worsen in the first week, two weeks, at most the first three weeks. If that person can make it past the first couple few weeks, then it's very unlikely they're going to have worsening vision from NAION. We also know from that same study that when they followed these patients for 15, or excuse me, for five years, followed them for five years, about 15% had the same thing happen in the other eye. And I often tell patients, after I tell them we have no proven treatment, I often tell them, you know, the worst thing I'm going to tell you is that all of those risk factors we just talked about are the same for your other eye. 
So the risk, what's the risk? And the risk is about 15%. About 15 out of 100, we're going to have a similar problem in the other eye. Now, I had a couple of uh, questions here about uh, NAI went from before the, um, the webinar. One of them was that I IOP elevations, intraocular pressure elevations have been associated with NAION. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I don't think there's a study that shows that high pressure is a factor. We do think that high pressure in the eye could decrease perfusion pressure of the disc. And certainly if someone has elevated intraocular pressure in the setting of NAION, I would lower their eye pressure. I do not lower eye pressures in patients with normal eye pressures. And there's a question, another question was, how do you manage incipient ischemic optic neuropathy? Um, incipient ischemic, I think, means very mild. The patient might even be asymptomatic. The answer is there is no treatment for NAION that's been proven. Several years ago now, there was an article published in Grafie's Clinical and Experimental Ophthalmology uh, from the United States, from Dr. Hayray. It was a retrospective study uh, where he looked at more than 600 patients with NAION. He, his point, his uh, practice had been to offer oral steroids, corticosteroids to patients with NAION. Some people took them, some people didn't. So it was, it was he called the study design patient choice. He found that overall, after, when looking at these patients all very retrospectively for 40 years, that there was no, no change or no difference in the two groups. He then looked at subgroups of patients defined as poor vision at presentation, 2070 or worse, versus good vision. There was no difference in the good vision group. But in the 2070 group, there was, uh, in his study, retrospective, there was a slight improve, uh, better uh, visual outcome in the group that got the oral corticosteroids. I would encourage you to read the article if you Google Hey Ray and Grafie's clinical experimental ophthalmology and NAION, I'm sure you'll find the article. My practice is if the visual acuity at presentation is better than 20, as 2060 or better, I don't talk about the paper. If it's 2070 or worse, I mention it and offer corticosteroids at that point. Um, I have not had anything that I think of as a great success with those, and probably at some point, unless there's further evidence, I will stop offering the corticosteroids. There was also one question before I get to, to arteritic, and that was, um, what about evolving in AON? Will you treat or observe? I will observe, as I just said, I don't believe there's a proven treatment for NAION. They're looking at things like intravitreal, Avastin, uh, and other medications, but at this point, I don't think anything has been proven to be of help. So what about non-arteritic? And I know depending on where you live, this uh, giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, uh, may or may not be uh, something you see frequently. If you don't see it at all, it may be because you're not looking. Um, certainly, I see it, but probably for every 100 patients I see with AION, with every 100, 95 have NAION, and five have arteritic, giant cell arteritis. So you always have to think about it. In particular, if there's pallid optic disc swelling, um, you need to think about it. Um, if there's very white color of the disc, because in giant cell, the mechanism is different. There, all the, the, there is no blood getting to the nerve. So it's unusual to see hemorrhages. It's unusual to see hyperemic swelling. It's usually gonna be pale. There may be cotton wool spots or nerve fiber layer infarcts in the retina. Uh, those should all be signs of possible giant cell arteritis. You need to ask the right questions. The most specific symptom that patients with giant cell arteritis have is jaw claudication. So jaw claudication is either pain or weakness with chewing. It's not pain with the first bite, but it's pain when they use the muscles of mastication or weakness. It can just be trouble chewing. So you have to be sure they say there's no pain, you must ask about weakness as well. They often, but not always, will have scalp tenderness. A new form of headache is very suspicious in someone over the age of 60. Fatigue, uh, malaise, just feeling generally bad. This is a condition that's unusual in the fi age 50s, more common over 60 and then more common as you get older than 60, 70, 80, and so on. We usually check blood tests, depending on our level of suspicion. Get, it's easy to get the blood tests usually, a sedimentation rate, a C-reactive protein, a CBC, a complete blood count with platelets. Elevated platelets are thought to be a marker. Um, if we have high level of suspicion, we get the blood tests and we start steroids 
um, while we're waiting for the blood test. Get the, get the blood test right before you get the blood, or get the blood test before you start the steroids, but start the steroids and get a temporal artery biopsy. Um, I never treat patients or virtually never treat patients for giant cell arteritis without a temporal artery biopsy. So we want to get that biopsy done within the first couple of weeks because, of course, the whole point of the steroids is to make the temporal artery biopsy normal, get rid of inflammation in the blood vessel walls. So you want to try to get the artery biopsy within the first couple of weeks, and you want to get a couple centimeters of the artery. There have been reports of skip lesions where um, a, bar, a small section of artery is obtained, there's no inflammation, but right next to that is inflammation. So you wanna get um, a lengthy section and look at a number of sections, hundreds of sections through the artery to show that there is, either is or is not inflammation. So think about temporal arteritis. Again, depending on where you live, this may be more or less common. Uh, there are some other reported causes and associations of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. One is with these PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra, Selidenafil, sil and its relatives. Um, the data on this now is thought to be there is probably a, a, an association and in patients who present with unilateral, in men with unilateral uh, NAION, uh, have, they have the disc at risk. I do talk about the potential risk of taking these, this type of medication and affecting their other eye. There's already a 15% chance of their other in, eye involvement. So we talk about the data that's out there regarding the association between the PDE5 inhibitors and uh, NAION. There's also been reports of uh, amiodarone-associated optic neuropathy. Um, I think that this is probably real. Um, the the half-life of amiodarone is very long, 100 days. We usually stop or recommend stopping the amiodarone in patients who come with optic disc swelling. The optic disc swelling may be unilateral or bilateral. Usually, in my experience, the vision loss is not severe. Um, I, I often call the cardiologist or the family doctor, depending on who started the amiodarone. I don't like to stop other doctors' medications without checking. Uh, and it's unusual uh, to me. I, I usually get one of two responses. One, they'll die if you stop their amiodarone. There is no other medication for them, in which case we continue the amiodarone. On the other hand, the, the, most, other, the most common response I get is, yeah, go ahead and stop it and they don't want to even start another drug. So I don't know, why are they on it to begin with if they don't need it? But that's the, probably the most common response I get is, yeah, just stop it, let's see what happens. Um, so uh, that's the, the amiodarone story. Um, there's been one publication back more than 13 years ago where they, even, um, that, where they try to differentiate amiodarone-induced optic neuropathy uh, from non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And you can see that in general, the vision loss isn't quite as bad. It can la the disc swelling can last for months and months. Again, the half-life of amiodarone is 100 days. Um, and so it's often uh, bilateral. And those are some of the main differences. These are some of the na other names for amiodarone, cordone, pacerone. Here's a patient, and I'm not sure if that's little box with my pictures in your way or not. It's in my way. Let me try to, yeah, it's better, I think. Um, the, uh, here's a patient who presents, um, and I can tell you they've lost vision in this eye. I'm just showing you the fundus. The other fundus looks exactly like this fundus, exactly the same. And there's been a sudden change in vision in this patient. Um, and this is someone who is elderly, I think in their 60s, uh, which I guess counts as elderly by my definition. And um, the history was very much that of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is rather rare. It's much different than non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So in a sense, non-arteritic, it's kind of idiopathic. We know that the vascular risk factors are there, but it, it's very rare to have someone to make a diagnosis, it should be very rare, to make a diagnosis of PION in someone who just is older with blood pressure and diabetes. And I would, I would advise you to be extremely careful about that diagnosis. I think in my 27 years as a neuro-ophthalmologist, um, I've probably made that diagnosis once in someone who was just a typical patient who with no other factors, just 
high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, and they had, had multiple problems with blood vessels in the past. By far the more, most common reason that I see true posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, again, posterior meaning there is no disc swelling. It's a retrobulbar form of optic neuropathy. It's sudden and onset. Usually it's after the most common things, times I see it are when the blood pressure bottoms out. So in dialysis patients, sometimes their blood pressure bottoms out and then they lose vision. Uh, after lots of blood loss from injury, from surgery, uh, their blood pressure and their, uh, they get very anemic. So you see it after uh, surgical procedures where there's a lot of blood loss or after resuscitation where there's cardiac arrest. I'm going to usually image these patients even if I think it's ischemic because I've been fooled in the past. Of course, the patient might say it was sudden. I've seen tumors present this way when the patient just suddenly noticed their vision was bad, not when they actually had true sudden loss of vision. So I'm gonna image them. Uh, if I see a retrobulbar optic neuropathy of any kind, um, they're gonna get, in my clinic, an MRI, at minimum, if you don't have MRI, a CT. So be, beware of the diagnosis of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy outside of the circumstances that I just mentioned. Dialysis, low blood pressure, lots of blood loss, cardiac arrest where they're not, their brain and nerves are not getting the right perfusion. I had a question that was submitted prior to the webinar. Um, how, and the question was differentiating PION from functional visual loss acutely. And uh, will it, there be a relative afferent pupillary defect? So certainly in functional vision loss, and I, I prefer the term non-organic vision loss, sometimes to use faking, malingering, functional, but in, in non-organic vision loss, of course, there will be no relative afferent pupillary defect. In the setting of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, if it's unilateral or if it's asymmetric, there will always be a relative afferent pupillary defect. If it's unilateral, or if it's asymmetric, just like any optic neuropathy that's unilateral or asymmetric, there's going to be a relative afferent pupillary defect. So to say just a little bit more about perioperative visual loss, because this is something we see, this is something that clearly generates lawsuits, um, and I'm an expert witness every so often for this type of a problem, but here's a 41-year-old gentleman who had a motor vehicle accident. He had a, very, he had a back injury very prolonged low back surgery to, le to relieve spinal cord compression. And he woke up and he couldn't see. He was NLPOU. His pupils were amorotic, which means they didn't react to light. Otherwise, his exam was completely normal. There was no relative afferent pupillary defect because he had a bilateral symmetric complete optic neuropathy. So neither pupil reacted. He had posterior bilateral, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy because during the surgery, which was prolonged. He lost a lot of blood. They had to resuscitate him once because his heart stopped. And he had, unfortunately, permanent bilateral vision loss from bilateral P-I-O-N. Here's another patient, a young guy who had low back surgery, uncomplicated, but it took nine hours. He did not have to be resuscitated. They kept his blood pressure on purpose in the low range, and he tended to run a higher blood pressure um, in his usual state. He did require some a transfusion with red blood cells, um, and he woke up with 20-20 vision, but a change in vision in his left eye and a left relative afferent pupillary defect with this inferior field defect and superior optic swelling, looking very much like a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Of course, in a 26-year-old, we typically would not consider the diagnosis, but he had undergone a nine-hour surgery with lots of blood loss and uh, low, relatively low blood pressure. So we think that this is a form of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy related to perfusion problems of his optic nerve. And we know that when, it, when you look at vision loss after surgical procedures, ischemic optic neuropathy is most common. The anesthesiologists are very interested in this condition because they get sued because of it. Unfortunately, it can often be bilateral and permanent um, and again, result in these medical legal issues. 
There have been some studies that look at case control, perioperative vision loss. This is an older study. They looked only at spine procedures and again, found uh, pr predominantly ischemic optic neuropathy uh, is causing the vision loss. Interestingly, when they looked at case control studies, there were no differences in the hematocrit, the, that is the level of anemia or the blood pressure. There's something about these patients. And when you talk to neurosurgeons and, and anesthetists, they'll say, gee, we do these cases all the time. People lose blood, they have low blood pressure, but only a very small number have loss of vision. Why those patients? And the answer is, we don't know for sure. Probably something about their anatomy. Maybe it has to do with collateral blood supply. We just don't know. There's a lot of proposed factors, including hypotension, blood loss, anemia, hypoxia, the duration of the surgery, hemodilution, et cetera. You can read this list of potential issues. Uh, we don't think that ocular compression really is a risk factor for optic neuropathy, but if you see a central retinal artery occlusion following surgery, it's probably because there had been pressure on the globe. So there is a practice advisory for perioperative visual loss that is generated by the anesthesiologist, um, and that is that we don't know for sure why these people get it. Likely there are multiple factors, but there is a high risk patient, quote unquote, who has prolonged prone spine surgery with made plus or minus substantial blood loss. So be careful, at least in the US, uh, anesthesiologists now consent patients uh, when they have them sign the operative consent for possible, but unlikely, visual loss after prolonged back surgery. All right, so I'm gonna move on now uh, to another case, and this is um, a, a patient, not the best fundus photograph, I apologize, but a patient with, I'm gonna try to move this, thing over here. I don't know if that's, I can see this little box that's hiding my slides. Um, maybe I can do that. There we go. Um, and you can see, hopefully, all this, again, I apologize for the quality of the slide. Um, there is, I will tell you, some disc swelling. This is a relatively young person, 37, who, a male who's had mild blurriness. Um, but interestingly, other than the blurriness that's mild, they know vision loss in their left eye when they look over to the left. So if they look to the left for more than a few seconds, their vision gets blurry and dim. And they have this mild disc swelling. Their vision in the right eye is norm, very good at 2015 and 2020 or 66 in the left eye. They see all the color plates with the right eye, but miss half of them or so with the left. And there is a left relative afferent pupillary defect. So this has been going on for some time, at least weeks or maybe months, the person's not sure. Um, and you can see um, the mild swelling. So my question is the same question I asked before. So we'll bring up the, the poll if our Orbis host can introduce that. And the question is, what do you think the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Is this ischemic? Is this compressive, nutritional, hereditary, or inflammatory? And I will give you um, um, a few more seconds to vote, 37 year old vision law or visual change, although their central vision is pretty good. And it, the interesting symptom of worse or vision worsening as they look to the left. So that's a fairly unusual story. And we'll see if we can broadcast. Okay, so we have a little bit more of a mixed bag here. We have the majority by a slight margin are saying compressive. Um, we have some votes for inflammatory and then some for ischemic. Okay, we can close that poll. Thank you. So let's look and see. So here's our patient. Here's their problem. Um, so they have a tumor, a benign tumor in their orbital apex, and they have this, uh, what's been described as gaze-evoked amaurosis. That is looking in a direction and vision getting worse, presumably because as they do that, their optic nerve gets stretched across an orbital apical tumor. And as they're looking in that, in that gaze, that optic nerve is being compressed. Maybe it's not getting the right blood supply, but basically this is the symptom. You won't hear it much of a uh, compressive optic neuropathy. I think the reason that this, the, the best answer probably is compressive. This is a 37 year old. They've noted blurriness for some time, but the gaze of oak thing really brings out the, the compressive. And I don't want to make it sound like that's a common symptom you're going to hear with compressive. But if you hear it, it's probably an orbital lesion. And again, there was swelling of the disc. We'll talk about that uh, related to compressive optic neuropathy. 
So the historical points are usually it's gradual, beware sudden awareness, as I mentioned previously, but usually the history, anytime someone says, you know, my vision's been getting blurry, it's gotten a bit worse over the last few weeks or months, I'm thinking not ischemic, not inflammatory, I'm thinking, uh-oh, could be compressive. Interestingly, it's usually painless, and patients, when I call them and to tell them, yep, it's a tumor, are, gee, I, there's no pain, I'm surprised. Usually compressive lesions are painless. And there are often no associated symptoms at all. And people are surprised, oh, I have no other problems, just this vision thing. Well, that certainly can be compatible with compressive optic neuropathy. Exam characteristics, of course, if the, again, if the optic neuropathy is unilateral or asymmetric, there should be a relative afferent pupillary defect. There doesn't have to be loss of visual acuity, although there often is. But like our patient, it could be an, a, a peripheral field loss from a compressive lesion as well. You will only see optic disc swelling if there's proximal optic nerve compression, proximal to the globe. So if there's a lesion in the orbit, you may or may not see disc swelling. If the, if the lesion, the compressive lesion is intracranial, like a pituitary tumor, probably one of the more common causes of optic neuro compressive optic neuropathy, you do not see optic disc swelling unless you have a big brain tumor that's causing increased intracranial pressure but compression of the optic nerve in the canal or intracranially usually does not result in optic disc swelling. There are rare reports of compression within the canal causing it, but if it's intracranial, you don't see it. So if you see disc swelling and it's compressive, it's usually gonna be orbital. You might see choroidal folds, which I'll try to demonstrate momentarily, and optociliary and or optociliary collateral vessels. And then don't forget to look for orbital signs. If there's an orbital lesion, look for proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, chemosis. So let's look at a few of these things. So again, there's gonna be an APD, a relative afferent pupillary defect, vision loss, decreased color vision if there's central loss of vision. Remember that disc swelling is usually only going to occur if the compression is right behind the globe. So this patient on the left had a tumor pushing on their nerve, no disc swelling, that's the more common scenario. Something pushing on the nerve behind the globe, you may see disc swelling. Here's the disc I showed you earlier, it's not the best photo, and it's tough to see this, that other than there's, there's blurring of the disc margins, but when I show you this photo, this red free photo, which you can see this view with a direct ophthalmoscope with that green filter, you see the much more obvious radial choroidal fold. Something is indenting the back of this eye. Uh, in this case, it was actually a metastatic melanoma pushing on the eye and the optic nerve. But you might see it with a tumor. You could see it with, if the extraocular muscles are really big. You can see it sometimes in papilledema where the optic nerve sheath is very distended behind the globe and indenting the back of the globe. You can see choroidal folds in a small hyperopic eye that are idiopathic and have nothing to do with tumor. Here's another optic disc. There's mild swelling. The disc margins are blurred. You can see that there are some Peyton's lines, these concentric folds where the mild disc swelling is pushing the retina aside, but you also see these two blood vessels. Where do they go? Just stops here and here. So these are so-called optociliary or retinochoroidal uh, collateral vessels. You can see these with old central retinal vein occlusions. There can be a tumor like a meningioma that is wrapped around the optic nerve. Here you see a nice MRI cutting right through the nerve, and this is all tumor above and below and circling that nerve 360 degrees. So in neuroophthalmology, when we think about gradually, slowly progressive vision loss, swelling of the disc, APD, we're worried about an optic nerve sheath meningioma. The pathophysiology is simply that these collateral vessels exist in everybody, but they're tiny. But if you've got something increasing central retinal venous outflow, that blood has to find a different way out of the eye, and that causes these collateral vessels to enlarge and the blood to go out through the choroid and through the vortex veins. So if you see these vessels, they again, they can be idiopathic, but you need to think about the entities. You can see them actually in elevated intraocular pressure too. Don't forget to look for orbital signs. Sometimes this is very obvious, like this patient with this marked bilateral upper and lower lid retraction and exophthalmus. You might see much more subtle 
exophthalmus, this patient actually was sent with left ptosis, and it was actually right exophthalmus and mild right lid retraction in thyroid eye disease. Here's a patient with obvious chemosis and exophthalmus, so no questions here. And sometimes if you don't have a Hertel exophthalmometer, you can increase the sensitivity of your examination by looking either from above, looking down across the corneas, or from below. Sometimes if the patient's sitting in their exam chair, I'll have them look up towards the ceiling, and I'll look across their corneas to, to look for more subtle evidence of relative um, exophthalmus in the eye with the optic neuropathy to try to see if this is an orbital process. So here's an interesting uh, kind of cute case of a young, fairly young guy, 42 year old, and his co chief complaint, believe it or not, was my vision's getting better. And I said, what, what do you mean your vision's getting better? He said, well, you know, I've worn glasses my whole life, uh, but you know, my left eye in the last few months, I don't need my glasses. In fact, I can take my glasses off and see great in my left eye. My right eye is just the same as it's always been. With the glasses on, I'm good. And here he is, better than 2020 or 6.6, with his current correction in the right eye of minus 2.25. However, in the left eye, which was minus 2.25, he is now Plano. And the problem, of course, is that the referring doc, the doc that referred him to me, found that there was a small left relative afferent pupillary defect. His color vision was slightly decreased, and there was mild swelling of the disc. So although the patient thought, hey, my vision's getting better, the bad news was you have a tumor pushing on the back of your eye. And the tumor is, make, is creating this hyperopic shift. It's compressing the optic nerve. So it's causing actually a mild optic neuropathy uh, with decreased color vision, a mild peripheral vision field defect. Uh, and so good news is you don't need your glasses. The bad news is you've got a tumor, a benign tumor, but it needs to be surgically removed. So I want to just talk about a few pitfalls in, in diagnosing compressive optic neuropathy. And the three pitfalls that you should not, uh, uh, that you should try to avoid are no contrast given on your imaging study, no fat suppression if it's an MRI. And the scan, remember, it's only as good as whoever the radiologist is or as good as you are. So let's look at some examples. So here's a patient, a young guy with an optic neuropathy. It's been going on for a few weeks. Um, and he'd been imaged before I saw him. He had a history of Ewing sarcoma of the femur that had been treated a few years ago, and he's thought to be cancer-free. But because he had the history of cancer, of course he got an MRI, but they didn't give contrast. And this was his MRI, it was read as normal. Um, we repeated the MRI uh, with contrast, and you can see here, that he has a contrast enhancing lesion in his optic canal, causing a compressive optic neuropathy, which killed him eventually. And so the point here is if you don't give the contrast, you may miss tumors. Meningiomas are tough to see. Ewing sarcoma, which is much rarer, tough to see without the gadolinium. So you need to give gadolinium. I, it's extremely rare that I will order an MRI without gadolinium or a CAT scan without contrast. Obviously, if there's kidney, um, uh, kidney problems and you can't order it, you can't order it. But I always order contrast or you'll be worried you may be missing something. And frankly, if you find something without contrast, what the, MR, the radiologist is gonna say, please repeat with contrast so we can better define the problem. The second um, pitfall is no fat suppression. So you can see in the MRI on your left, if you get a brain MRI, a brain MRI, you will see pictures of the eye sockets, but they won't do fat suppression, and fat is bright white. This is the patient on the, with fat suppression with an orbital MRI. You can see now the fat signal has been suppressed, and there's an obvious enhancing optic nerve sheath meningioma that you will not see if you, if you don't do fat suppression because the fat is white, the tumor is white, so they look, they blend together. So if you're thinking, if the patient has a unilateral optic neuropathy or an orbital process, order orbit MRI. You'll get brain, but order orbit. I don't order orbit and brain in the US because they'll charge twice as much, which will be thousands of dollars. 
And here are four MRIs. These are all MRIs that were read as normal. The top MRIs are from patients with what I thought was optic neuritis. You can see there is enhancement of the distal optic nerve here where the arrow is. Uh, that was read as normal. The chiasm here, just in front of the chiasm, the distal optic nerve, enlarged, enhancing, read as normal. The patient in the bottom left had what it looked to me like thyroid eye disease. I wasn't sure, but I said, please look at the extraocular muscles. The scan was read as normal, yet that, ex that inferior rectus muscle is three times normal size. And finally, a patient who had this MRI before I saw them with double vision, they, they were, it was read, the scan was requested to rule out causes of double vision. This is in a patient with known uh, gastric cancer. This is a gastric met metastasis to the superior oblique muscle. This scan was read as normal. So be careful. Radiologist depends on your radiologist, how good they are. If you don't feel comfortable looking at the films yourselves and you're surprised though by the normal result, call the radiologist and say, please look one more time. This is specifically what I'm looking for. Um, I try to be very specific when I order the MRIs and tell them exactly what I'm asking for. Nevertheless, I'll get the report back and under indication, sometimes even though we've given them three sentences as to where we think the problem is and why, all it says in the indication is blurry vision <laughs> because the technician who's scheduling it doesn't want to write it all down. All right, here's a 22-year-old gentleman, blurry vision in the right eye for one month. They're 2200 or 636. They don't see any of the color plates, the hardy ran rittler HRR color plates, and they have a right relative afferent pupillary defect. They have a central scotoma, and here's the picture of their, their optic disc. It looks like maybe there's a little swelling, a little hyperemia of the disc. So typically, I would look at this in the United States and say, oh, this is probably typical optic neuritis. Problem is that this kid's uh, brother is a patient of mine, and the brother, who's 15 years old, has labor hereditary optic neuropathy. And he had the same thing happen a year ago. It happened in one eye, and then it happened in the other eye. So in this case, I know the family history, and the family history of this is gonna be labor. And that disc swelling isn't really true disc swelling. And we'll talk, oh, darn it, I was gonna ask you what you thought. Well, I'm gonna skip that question since I gave it away. Uh, so labor, hereditary optic neuropathy, um, usually there's central loss of vision, not complete loss of vision. So there's gonna be a central scotoma uh, with pretty good peripheral vision. It's painless um, and initially it's usually one eye, but it, fairly rapidly and it can be the next day, the next week, the next month, but usually within the next month, the second eye will be involved. It's gonna look like Optic neuritis initially, young healthy person, loss of vision, possibly what appears to be slight swelling of the disc, um, most commonly in men in the 10 to 30 year range, but it's been reported in uh, more than age up to 65. It's reported in two year old up to 80 something. And although it's more common in men and young men, it can happen any age and it can happen in women. So uh, being a woman doesn't mean it can't be labor hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, as I mentioned, the second eye is involved usually weeks to months, rarely a much longer interval, been reported up to eight years. The vision loss is usually permanent, although uh, depending on what mutation you have, there is a percent chance of improvement spontaneously even a year later. The fundus appearance might show it looks like mild disc swelling, but there will be no fluorescein dye leakage on fundus, uh, fundus fluorescein angiography, as is shown in these photos stolen from this website. Most commonly, the mitochondrial DNA mutation is at the 11778 position, but there are the other two common, uh, relatively common point mutations are 3460 and 14484. For reasons that are totally unclear, we don't, we, uh, to us, the 14484 mutation, if you're going to have one of these, is the one to have with spontaneous improvement in vision up to two out of three patients. Unfortunately, the 11778 is by far the most common identified mutation with a much lower chance of improvement. 
And as you know, uh, this is a mitochondrial problem. Uh, it is transmitted from um, met from women to kids because there's one mitochondria in the sperm and millions in the egg. So this is not transmitted from the fathers, only from affected um, mothers to kids. There is no proven treatment. There are some trials going on. Recently, there was one using dibinone, uh, which is available uh, over the counter in, uh, in the United States on amazon.com. Um, this study um, was done in England. It looked at this medication uh, and found no statistically significant improvement, although there were some trends. There are definitely a bunch of, uh, there are at least a few experimental um, compounds, uh, drugs out there that are being used that I'm told by friends who are using them have some promise. Uh, there is um, uh, a trial going on at Baskin Palmer uh, Eye Institute in Miami, United States, uh, Miami, Florida, United States, uh, where they're recruiting patients who've lost vision in one eye from labors, um, who are then, of course, theoretically going to lose vision in the other eye to, to look at, to, to do things genetically. That's in very fledgling sort of status. So no proven treatment, as I mentioned, um, this is some of the data from the study, so I'm not going to belabor this um, regarding the treatment of labor hereditary optic neuropathy. At the moment, um, no proven treatment. And then the other hereditary optic neuropathy that we see, also no proven treatment, is dominant optic atrophy. So dominant meaning that it's, it's uh, a dominant gene. So um, one of the parents should have it, and each child has a 50% chance of having the condition. Um, this is usually detected in asymptomatic children. So in the United States, um, kids usually have a screening a visual study before going to school at the age of five or six. And they're found to be in the 20, 30, 40 range, so 6, uh, 12 range. Uh, the kid doesn't know their vision's not bad. That's just the way it's always been. They're not complaining. Uh, they get sent for glasses. The glasses don't, don't help. And then usually you'll see some temporal, relative temporal pallor of both optic discs. The color vision usually will be decreased. The parents may or may not say they have a problem. I usually check the color vision in the parents if they're both there. Uh, and usually one of them has poor color vision, at least if they don't know they have the problem. They were just never told they had it because their vision's in the 2012, excuse me, uh, 612 or better range. Um, and they're, they're asymptomatic. Now, this is a very variable course, so it can gradually worsen over years and decades. I certainly have people who are legally blind from this condition by the time they're in their 40s. I have people who really have not had a big change in vision over decades. So it may slowly progress. It should not rapidly progress, um, or it may not progress. There is no treatment we know of to prevent progression uh, or to fix the problem. In the United States, we can obtain these blood tests. They cost more than $1,000. There is no treatment, and insurance in the United States usually doesn't pay. Patients usually don't want the blood tests. Visual fields are typically uh, the same sort of look as um, labors, that is there's central or seco central scotomas like you're seeing here. Again, this doesn't make you blind blind. Um, your peripheral vision is usually pretty good. People are actually usually very functional, uh, maybe can't drive, but do well typically. Here's another patient um, with a retrobulbar optic neuropathy. So when I use the term retrobulbar, that simply means that you look that the person has evidence of optic neuropathy, but you look at their fundus and their optic nerves look normal. So this is a 44-year-old gentleman. He has blurry vision, both eyes for about a month. You think it's gradually been getting a little worse. He's 2040 or 612 in both eyes. He misses most of the HRR color plates. And his fields look like this. He's got the central, seco-central scotomas. So the question is, the same question that we've seen before, and we'll have the poll, what do you think is most likely going on? So this is a bilateral, fairly symmetric process. He is symptomatic, and he really thinks it's been a couple months. He thinks his vision was okay prior. Um, there's been no pain. Um, his fundus are normal. Uh, his fields are, as I showed you, sort of central, secocentral scotomas. And so I'll we'll give you a, a few seconds to vote. And I'll let the, ho the Orbis host decide when to call it. He knows about how many 
votes we've been getting in the past. So let's take a look at what people think. All right, so the majority of you have the correct answer. This is probably nutritional, probably not ischemic or inflammatory. Why not? Well, those are typically sudden onset. This is sort of gradual and getting worse. Hereditary, well, it possibly could be. I mean, this could potentially be labor, hereditary, optic neuropathy. You don't have to see what looks like disswelling or pseudo disswelling. He's 44, a little older. It's bilateral and symmetric. It, it, potentially, it's in the list. Um, compressive, yeah, this could be compressive. Um, it would have to be very symmetric, bilateral. So we're not thinking about bilateral orbital process. It could be some intracranial process com at, symmetrically compressing both up. Eh, pretty rare. And honestly, I've never seen a compressive lesion cause the seco central scotoma. So nutritional makes a lot of sense. Let's we can close out that um, and let's move on. So nutritional optic neuropathy is usually gradual, bilateral, painless vision loss, often in alcoholics in the United States who drink all their calories. So the question when you ask them if they drink and they say, yeah, one glass a day, well, ask them how big the glass is. Um, so how many, you know, what does that mean? And so, I mean, it's not uncommon for me to have someone say, oh, I have, I drink, I say, what do you like to drink? Oh, gin, how much? Oh, you know, a quart a day. And that's not uncommon. And the general rule of thumb is double whatever they tell you. But if you drink that much, you're probably not eating a lot of food and getting the right nutrition. Um, so they often have central or secocentral scotomas. Their disc may be normal, ultimately, of course, and unfortunately, they become atrophic and then it's permanent. We look for these patients, uh, vitamin B12, folic acid, serum folic acid, red blood cell folate, uh, thiamine or B1. And if the person has a history of gastric bypass surgery for weight loss, um, and it's important to get that history um, because people with gastric bypass surgery often have poor uh, nutritional absorption. Um, they also, I will also check a copper level. So copper deficiency optic neuropathy is relatively recently described. I've seen a couple cases. I only check copper, at least in the United States, in patients who've had gastric bypass surgery. But f red blood cell folate is um, kind of like a hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C in diabetics is kind of a measure of chronic, your chronic blood sugar level, blood glucose level. So is red blood cell folate for folate. So if the person goes to the doctor in the morning and decides, I'm gonna have a good breakfast this morning, their serum folate may be normal. And in a paper that we wrote some years ago now on folate deficiency optic neuropathy, we reported six patients, three of whom had low serum and red blood cell folate levels, but the other three had normal serum folate and low red blood cell folate levels. And they all improved with folate supplementation in their diets. So here, so that's sort of what I have to say about nutritional optic neuropathy. Now, around the world, that may be way more common than in the United States, where we really only see it in alcoholics or maybe after gastric bypass surgery. Here's another patient, a little older, 66, with another bilateral retrobulbar optic neuropathy. Their visual acuity is down some, 2040 or 612 OU. Color vision also down. Their fields look like this. And because of this visual field defect, which looks kind of bi-temporal, they'd already had an MRI. And the MRI was said to be normal. I looked at the MRI, it looked normal. But they didn't get the important part of the history. And that is this patient was on a Thambiotol for Mycobacterium AVR. Um, and they, were, they had a thambiotol toxicity, which is by far the most common toxic optic neuropathy I see in the United States. Um, and it's, it's certainly very common in countries where there's a lot of tuberculosis. So Philippines, common thambiotol optic neuropathy, maybe one of the most common forms of optic neuropathy. It's usually fairly symmetric, like nutritional. It's a systemic problem. And I always warn patients, first of all, you need to stop the athambutol. And I talked to their doctor who prescribed it. And I warn them, you may get worse before you get better, even after you stopped it. And here's the same patient who came back another six weeks 
and I, he was worse. So now he's 2100 and 2080 and terrible looking by temporal and central scotomas. And I repeated the MRI because I was so worried that maybe we missed something. Normal MRI. And sure enough, after we waited another uh, six months, five months, his vision was back to 2025, almost 6'6", and his, vis his visual fields were almost back to normal. Um, I usually treat these patients, and this is not evidence-based, but I treat these patients with um, copper and zinc supplementation in the form of uh, Occuvite with lutein. I have no financial interest in Occuvite, but it has a lot of copper uh, in it. Um, Athambutol uh, works, by, uh, works as an antibiotic by uh, chelating metal ions, and you need some of the um, enzymes in your electron transport chain need metal ions like copper, and so you need to supplement them. Um, now, that's not evidence-based, but that's what I do. So, ethambutol, optic neuropathy, common form in the United States, by far most common form, toxic optic neuropathy. So, in summary for this webinar, ischemic optic neuropathy is usually sudden, painless, and the disc is usually swollen. And it's usually, in the U.S., non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, sudden loss of vision in an older person, disc is normal, is rare outside of dialysis hypotension surgery. Some obvious recent bad low blood pressure, blood loss, something like that, Hyper, hypo perfusion. Compressive optic neuropathy is usually painless. Make sure you get the correct imaging like we described. Labors, hereditary optic neuropathy may mimic optic neuritis, but It'll, it, the clue will be the other eyes affected within a short order. Nutritional toxic optic neuropathy should be suggested if you take a good history. So that's my summary. Now, I, there were some questions I'm not going to go th into right now. I'm going to have some other questions. I think that I think our Orbis host will be able to bring up the questions that have been typed in on the screen, I believe. Um, I'm thinking for our next webinar, I don't think it's been advertised, but I think for our next webinar, I'm going to probably try to cover papilledema because we haven't talked about papilledema. And then um, it'll be sort of a papilledema webinar, but I'm going to throw in a, uh, a, a 15, 20 minutes on differentiating glaucomatous optic neuropathy from neurologic optic neuropathy. Um, I think maybe I click on the question and answer thing up here. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so let's start, I'm going to start with the first question here, which was, um, uh, well, I'm not sure it's a question, and it just says N -A -N -A -I -O -N slash GCA, um, and that's not really a question. Um, what are the routine investigations you advise in AION? So again, it depends on whether you think that this is non-arteritic AION or arteritic. Again, the majority of people, it's non-arteritic, so I recommend the patient uh, if they haven't seen their family physician in the last mm, four to six months and have had blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes checks, they need those things checked. So a fasting cholesterol panel, fasting glucose, blood pressure check. Um, if there is a suggestion of sleep apnea uh, these days, I recommend a sleep study. Um, if they have um, high blood pressure and are taking blood pressure medications at night, I recommend taking them earlier in the day. Um, if, they, if, they, if there's any chance, I'm thinking this could be giant cell arteritis, then clearly they're going to have uh, a sedimentation rate, a CBC with platelets, and a C-reactive protein. And depending on my level of suspicion, might even start them on steroids before I get the results, and then, of course, obtain a temporal artery biopsy. Um, uh, how, what, the next question is how to differentiate between retrobulbar optic neuropathy and um, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So posterior ischemic optic neuropathy early on is a form of retrobulbar optic neuropathy. Oh, oh maybe that, I'm sorry, maybe that should be retrobulbar neuritis. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume this is how to differentiate between retrobulbar neuritis and posterior. And the answer is very difficult. Certainly in a young person, with no vascular risk factors, who's not on dialysis and has not you know, lost a lot of blood, it's never going to be posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. 
um, it's always going to be pretty much, it's going to be retrobulbar optic neuritis, although I'm going to get an, an imaging study to make sure it's not a tumor pushing on their nerve. But um, in an older person, I, then there is no way to differentiate. Certainly, if there's a lot of pain, pain with eye movement, I'm going to lean towards neuritis and not ischemia. And again, if, if it's uh, an older person, even if they're older with vascular risk factors, if there's no history or cause of extreme low blood pressure or blood loss, then it's just very rare to have a PION. Um, all right. Um, is there any rule for ah, uh, fun, uh, fluorescein angiography for PION? Well, certainly that can be helpful. Uh, for me, it's usually, I mean, usually helpful in the setting of, um, it, could this be giant cell arteritis? So giant cell arteritis, I may not have mentioned it, but giant cell arteritis, and I should have, and I didn't, could definitely cause posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, although most likely it's going to be an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Giant cell arteritis can cause a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So I am going to think about that in anybody who, I, who has sudden loss of vision in the right age range. And the way that fluorescein angiography helps is poor uh, delayed choroidal or poor choroidal circulation. If you see that in someone who you're thinking about GCA, then that's good evidence of GCA, of giant cell arteritis. Um, question, what is definitive diagnosis of PION? There, there probably is no definitive diagnosis of PION. It is gonna be, there's no test. It's gonna be in the, in the patient with what I just mentioned, bad choroidal fluorescence uh, with fluorescein angiography in giant cell arteritis. It's going to be someone who awakes from surgery with um, a bi unilateral or bilateral op optic neuropathy, normal fundus, uh, lost a lot of blood, had low blood pressure. So it is a, a diagnosis of exclusion um, and assumption. Um, is it possible to differentiate the compressive and hereditary neuropathy on seeing fundus photos alone? Um, if you see um, choroidal folds, like we talked about, um, uh, the radial choroidal folds indicating something's pushing on the back of the eye, or you see collateral vessels, that, that, that's not going to be hereditary unless, of course, they're idiopathic. So that said, if you, the more common scenario would be normal fundus or mild pallor, and there's no way to differentiate heredity from um, uh, compressive. And I think in the next webinar, now that you mention it, I'll, I'll throw in a little bit about optic atrophy. We did a study some years ago and found in people with unexplained optic atrophy, and I'll talk about this next webinar, unexplained optic atrophy. We had 97 patients in our study from the University of Cincinnati and the University of Iowa. Of the 97 patients with unexplained optic atrophy, all of them got imaged, 25, more than 25% had a tumor. So you can't just look at a pale nerve, and we'll talk about that next time, and say, aha, this was caused by X, Y, or Z. Um, all right. Um, what do you think about, oops, what do you, maybe I should start at the newest one. Um, hold on a second. What do you think about the three-parent strategy for mitochondrial inherited conditions? I only heard about it recently, whereby they remove the mitochondria Oh, uh, so this is a question relating to, uh, I assume, to treatment of mitochondrial inherited disorders. And my answer is, honestly, I don't know anything about it. Um, that is not what they're doing in the, in the study at Bascom Palmer on labor hereditary optic neuropathy, so I will have to read up on it. I don't know anything about it. Um, how many milligrams of copper? Okay. I usually want them to get at least two micrograms of copper a day, two to four micrograms. And it's really more the copper than the zinc. Um, in the Occuvite with lutein, what I use, it, the pills are two micrograms per pill. I usually have them to take two per day. Um, steroids for treatment of acute traumatic optic neuropathy with no light perception, vision, no fair. That's, we didn't talk about traumatic optic neuropathy. I suppose that maybe I could throw that in as a miscellaneous next time. Um, so there is no evidence base for treatment of acute uh, traumatic optic neuropathy. Um, the only study that was a crappy study, terrible study, uh, was a survey study on that. And the bottom line of the study was there is no standard of care. I usually do use 
um, low to moderate doses of steroids for traumatic optic neuropathy, not mega doses that they used to use. I used for a while uh, from the um, uh, the study that uh, the NASIS study, the acute spinal shock treatment studies. For a while, some years ago, we were using mega, mega doses of intravenous steroids. I, I don't use those anymore. That's been shown to probably not be good. It may be bad. Um, I do use um, either oral or intravenous steroids in acute traumatic optic neuropathy, whether it's NLP or whether it's uh, 612. Um, I use them for a week or two. If there's improvement, I continue them. If there's no improvement, I stop them. I use anywhere from 60 milligrams of prednisone um, a day to 1,000 milligrams of methylprednisolone intravenous for three days, followed by oral prednisone. Um, uh, okay, hold on a second. Someone's asking me to show the last slide. Oops, let me try to get to that last slide. Uh, oh. And let me move those questions out of the way if I can. I'm not sure if the questions are covering your slide or just mine. Um, all right, uh, is it possible for NI? Is it possible for NAION for patients who had postpartum hemorrhage? Sure. I mean, you, you can have an NAION, you could have a PION. If you lose enough blood, for whatever reason, you can have an, a, an either an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, what is your overall experience with the Thambutol-induced optic neuropathy? So overall, my experience is that people usually have good recovery of vision. Now, um, I think it, it depends, of course, on how, in a sense, on how bad their initial vision is. So in general, having better vision at diagnosis bodes, is a, is a good prognostic sign for recovery. The only patient I can remember who didn't have pretty good, and when I say pretty good recovery, I mean in the 6.6 to 6.12 range, is a plastic surgeon who was being treated for um, tuberculous renal failure and they misdosed him. And because the Thambutol is cleared through the kidneys, he was on way too high a dose. And he, I didn't see him until he was light perception OU. And he had no recovery and he won a big malpractice settlement. Um, he had no recovery of vision. So overall, my experience is good, but I always warn the people, as I said, your vision may get worse even after you stop the medicine. And then I wait and then I see them in six or eight weeks, see where they are, and then tell them hopefully over six or 12 months, you'll have gradual visual recovery. Um, would you stop steroids in giant cell arteritis even if the CRP is not really back to normal or going up or down? Um, so I don't base my treatment of giant cell arteritis much on the blood tests. Uh, my routine treatment for giant cell arteritis is, my routine is actually, uh, high dose oral steroids, um, 80, 100 milligrams to start, rarely intravenous, but usually I treat them with 80 or 100 of prednisone. I decrease their dose by 20 milligrams a month, every month, until I get to, to 40 milligrams. So 100 for a month, 80, 60, 40. From, at 40, I go to 30 for a month, 20 for a month, 15, 10, and then I leave them on five for the duration of one year. Um, of course, there can be side effects and problems. I try to manage those with their family doctor during the course of that year. At the end of the year, I, I tell them that we could try to get them off or just leave them on five forever. People who've lost vision usually opt for the five forever. I can tell you, knock on wood, that in doing that, I have never had someone lose vision in their good eye on that protocol um, in 27 years. Um, I tell the patient that that treatment is not to help the vision in their already bad eye if they have a bad eye. I tell them the first week after starting the steroids is the crucial week. Um, it, you could lose vision in that first week, but if you don't, you probably won't. Um, so I do check blood tests along the way. Usually I don't even check blood tests until we get down to 20 in that scheme I just mentioned. Uh, because the steroids are going to lower it. I don't, the CRP is fairly meaningless to me, um, but I base my treatment 
mostly on recurrent symptoms and the combination of symptoms and the SED rate. Um, if PION is a systemic fall in blood pressure, why is it so often unilateral? Good question. No idea. It probably has to do with the um, individual nature of the blood supply to the nerve. In other words, the, the, the question that people, that the neurosurgeons and the anesthesiologists ask is, why that person? There was nothing different about that case in terms of the low blood pressure, in terms of the amount of blood pressure, or excuse me, the amount of blood loss. There was no difference in that case. The person is blind. Those other 100 patients have normal vision. They're, you look at their record, no difference. It probably has to do with, with just the different individual variations in blood supply to the optic nerves. Uh, and that's about as good an answer as I can give you. Um, hold on a sec. Um, how can you distinguish pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome from Foster Kennedy syndrome uh, on visual field testing? You can't. Um, I mean, neuroimaging is the only way to differentiate. Uh, now, most you know, and for those who aren't familiar perhaps with the term, so Foster Kennedy is um, a unilateral uh, disc swelling with contralateral optic atrophy described by Foster Kennedy in patients with giant brain tumors um, big enough to cause compression of one optic nerve and increased intracranial pressure and swelling of the opposite optic nerve very rare, at least in the United States. I've seen that once in 27 years. So the vast majority of my patients with what appears to be a Foster Kennedy syndrome have pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome and sequential non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, correct to state altitudinal. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, well, seco central secocentral will still be unlikely, I think, in pseudo Foster Kennedy. Um, you're going to just have crappy looking visual fields in the eye with optic atrophy. It's not going to be seco central. I've never seen a compressive lesion cause a seco central scotoma. Um, and you're right, um, altitudinal is more likely going to be NAION. I don't think it's proof. It might make me feel a little better if I don't have any imaging. But remember, a pseudo Foster, a Foster Kennedy syndrome, I mean, it's going to, if it's a true Foster Kennedy, it's going to be a big tumor. I mean, even a non contrast CT is going to show you that. So if you can't get a non contrast CT, I guess that's a problem. But yeah, I mean, I feel a bit better if you can't get imaging and it's, you know, the guy, the person has bilateral altitudinal defects, um, that would make me feel better. But I don't think it rules it out absolutely. I've seen tumors cause altitudinal field defects. Um, is there any connection between PT, APT, and INR patient with anyone? Not that I know of. Any benefit to start on anticoagulation treatment? Um, no evidence base for anticoagulation treatment. Now, there have been a couple of retrospective studies that look at aspirin. The problem is the studies basically are retrospective, that what they do is they look at patients who come in who develop um, NAION on aspirin or off aspirin. Um, and the, one study showed no difference. Uh, one study showed maybe aspirin was helpful in preventing a second attack or the sequential attack. The bottom line is there's not a great, answer, a great, a great evidence for it. I usually recommend aspirin. Um, I tell them, listen, we don't have good evidence. Usually they have other risk factors that have, aspirin might be benefit. Me personally, if I had any, I went in one eye, I would probably take a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams a day, unless I had some uh, side effect that was preventing me from doing it. Um, hold on, let me see, where am I here? Uh, what is the prognosis of compressive versus nutritional optic neuropathy? Both, I think, depend on how long has the compression or nutritional problem been present. Is there already optic atrophy? And of course, these days, OCT will tell you if they've lost nerve fiber layer. Obviously, if they've lost nerve fiber layer on OCT, the prognosis is not real good. Um, if they have optic atrophy, clearly there's some permanent damage to their vision. If they come in with normal looking discs in either compressive or nutritional, normal OCT, uh, then the prognosis is probably pretty good as long as you can get rid of the compression or and get rid of the nutritional deficiency. Um, 
why is it definitely not NAI win if there's no swelling? Uh, because the A in NAION, um, the A in NAION stands for anterior. And the anterior means you have to have optic disc swelling. It's, um, I don't know, it's, I'm trying to think of an analogy. Um, well, it's like saying, re, re, the, the, why can't the person have a retrobulbar optic neuropathy and they have disc swelling? Because they have disc swelling. You can't have a retrobulbar optic neuropathy if there's swelling of the nerve by definition. So it's simply a definition. Um, what, uh, what do you use to treat dominant optic at neuropathy? Nothing. There is no known treatment for dominant optic neuropathy. Um, what about citicoline and traumatic optic neuropathy? I have no idea. Maybe I should look it up. I'll write it down. Uh, never heard of it. Um, um, do you ever use ultrasound to diagnose giant cell arteritis? So their, their rheumatologists oftentimes will use ultrasound um, of the temporal artery to diagnose giant cell arteritis. Um, I never use it um, because I don't consider it of a gold standard, number one. Uh, number two, I've, I've certainly had patients with normal temporal artery ultrasound and positive temporal artery biopsies. Um, and so I, again, you're, you're, you're considering a condition that can make you bilaterally blind forever. Um, I, I want the gold standard tree, uh, diagnostic testing for that condition. Um, the patient is NLP. Any indications for treatment? Sure, um, I think so. Let's, if the person is NLP, I mean, first of all, I certainly see optic neuritis, typical and atypical optic neuritis that is NLP who respond, the atypical optic neuritis patients who return to 2020 with who are NLP. Um, I've seen neuromyelitis optica after plasmapheresis return to 2020 from NLP. Um, we've reported thyroid compressive optic neuropathy, NLP, with recovery of vision when the compression is removed. Um, have you ever witnessed recovery of vision from NLP steroids? Okay, so that, I just answered that one. Certainly it's common. I've seen recovery of vision from NLP with no treatment in typical optic neuritis as well. Um, typical optic neuritis. Do you see much vigabatrin toxicity? No, um, I don't. It has been reported to cause retinal toxicity. Um, I don't see much of it. It's not used a lot. And I don't see lots of kids because we have a huge children's hospital. So I think they might see it more than I do. Um, and I would stop the drug if you see it. I don't know if it, would, if it resolves. It's a retinopathy. Uh, we don't see the slides you see in, uh, oh, so one viewer says, we don't see the slides you see and talked about a couple of times during your speech. You just see them. Okay, that's interesting. I'm not entirely sure how that could happen, um, but thanks for that information. Um, maybe next time we'll ask if you think you're seeing a slide that I'm, you're not, write it down what I'm talking about because I just kept advancing slides and talking per usual. Um, we do recommend a thambut. We do oh recommence a thambutol. A, do we recommend a thambutol after vision recovers? No. Um, high dose of vitamin B in toxic optic neuropathy. Um, in toxic, I don't use high doses of uh, vitamin B in toxic optic neuropathy. I use high doses of vitamin B12 in B12 deficiency optic neuropathy. Um, older TB patients do not recover vision, vision better than number, uh, younger. Um, you know, I don't have that experience. The patients that I've seen, and again, I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about tuberculous optic neuropathy, infectious optic neuropathy, I have never seen a case of tuberculous optic neuropathy in the United States. Um, and I, don't, I have really no experience. I've seen it in India in other countries, but I don't have a chance to follow those patients. If you're talking about older tuberculosis patients who take ethambutol and have ethambutol optic neuropathy, I have seen older patients recover vision. I have not found there to be any difference in recovery 
if it's an ophthalmutal optic neuropathy, I don't know the answer if it's tuberculous, actual infective optic neuropathy. Um, would you use only steroids and GCA? So certainly acutely, I would only use steroids and GCA. The time that I would use other medications, say um, methotrexate, something like that, uh, uh, would be if the patient were trying to taper the steroids, like we, like I discussed, and we're coming down, but we can't get lower than say 20 milligrams of prednisone or 15 milligrams of prednisone. Every time we get lower, they have recurrent symptoms or the, and or the blood tests go way up. Then that would be the time I would consider adding a steroid sparing agent. I, would, I usually work with a rheumatologist when I do that. I don't prescribe it myself. And once the rheumatologist tells me that the, the, the immunosuppressive agent seems is, should be working, and then we try again to taper the prednisone or the steroids. Is there a role for abetinone in labors? So there's a study that's looked at that, as I mentioned. The study did not show a statistic, statistically significant benefit to using it. There was a trend, they like to say, but it did not show statistically significant change. Will MRI show signal in PION? Interesting question. It might. Um, I have actually reviewing a case for publication from a, from a uh, journal where they've shown uh, they have an MRI done with diffusion weighted imaging, which is great for looking at ischemic brain. And they study, and there have been other reports of ischemic optic neuropathy being identified on MRI if you use diffusion weighted imaging. <clears throat> um, let's see. Somazina is citicoline, and some advocate it for AION. I'll have to look it up. Never heard of it. Uh, Somazina. Let me write it down. Um, I don't know. I, I'd be shocked if there's any good data since I routinely talk to people around the world and they, no one's ever mentioned it to me. Um, I'm in Berlin, Germany. I have no problem seeing the slides or hearing your voice. Good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why a slide would sh not show for an individual. I, I, it might be that they were just mistaken about the slide and that maybe I was talking about something that didn't seem right or something. Um, how to differentiate between normal tension glaucoma and optic neuropathy. Okay, tune in next time. I'm going to include that in my next neuro-ophthalmology webinar. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a potpourri. I'm going to do, we'll, we'll do papilledema. We'll do, is it glaucoma or is it neurologic? And then I was, I'll throw in maybe just very briefly a little bit about traumatic optic neuropathy, and I'll try to add in whatever I can find on soma, xena, acetylcholine, since obviously I've never heard of it. Um, okay, also good from Egypt. All right. Um, that is the end of the question. So, uh, I think I will stop there. Um, hopefully, um, there were some uh, good information for people, and I look forward. I don't know. I don't think we've scheduled for sure the next neuro ophthalmology orbit orbis webinar, um, but um, um, I appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll see some of you. We'll be in uh, Singapore at the Asian Pacific Academy meeting in February, and I'll be elsewhere around the world the rest of the year. So look forward to seeing and hearing from you. Oh, I have one more about traumatic optic neuropathy. I want to know what is your approach, pulse. Uh, so I, again, with traumatic, we'll talk more about it next time. But I usually, if they're, if they're an inpatient and um, are going to be in the hospital anyway, I use uh, one gram of, si of, intra of methylprednisolone a day for a few days, and then oral prednisone, 60 to 80 milligrams of prednisone, for a couple of weeks, see if they're improving. If there's some improvement, then I gradually taper. If there's no improvement, I rapidly taper. Okay, I'm gonna sign off. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Um, have a great uh, day and happy New Year's.